Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to the third episode of uh, Have We Got Planning News for You. My name uh, is Charlie Banner, um, and thank you all very much for joining us. Welcome back to those of you who are now seasoned veterans of the show, and, and hello to the newcomers. Um, most of you know the format now. Um, we're here to provide hopefully an informative but also informed and light-hearted take on recent events in the planning world. What we don't have in PowerPoint slides, we make up for in drink. Um, and on the subject of drinks, I must confess this. I, I do actually do this for my, my room in my chambers because I've got a genuine reasonable excuse to be here in my own room. Um, and I do wonder what the, the one other person on my floor thinks. You've all got glass doors. What he thinks when at uh, before five o'clock on the Thursday afternoon, I wander down the corridor, grab a bottle of wine and a glass, and then sit in my room talking at my computer screen. Uh, I'm not sure that's quite approved uh, practice in his field of, of chancery. <laughs> Uh, but there we are. Um, I did actually have to explain to him what I was doing, uh, so he doesn't think I've got a serious problem. <laughs> um, anyway, on a serious note, um, as you know, this is a, a free show, but um, can we remind you um, that there's a link in the invite um, to the NHS COVID-19 uh, appeal uh, Just Giving page, uh, and if we can encourage you, please, to think about making a donation to that, to that or to a charity of your choice, if you prefer. A few bits of the usual housekeeping to kick off. Um, Please use your uh, gallery view function in Zoom. That's going to be the easiest way to uh, to follow the proceedings. If the connection is lost, um, the same details work to uh, connect back again. Um, please do provide uh, any questions or comments in the Q&A function, as you've been doing um, in previous shows. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can uh, during the show and the rest uh, by our Just Giving page, which, uh, once again, I encourage you to, to follow our LinkedIn page. So not Just Giving, we're not the benefit. <laughs> Should, should add. Um, you're all automatically muted and not visible to us. Um, I said that at the webinar yesterday and as soon as I said it literally dozens of participants started turning on their uh, the video cameras I was giving my presentation which was frightfully uh, um, uh, disconcerting. I don't think the settings uh, enable you to turn on your camera uh, today but if they do please make sure you've got some clothes on um, uh, before. <laughs> um, now it's time to introduce the panel and our special guests. So um, can I um, start uh, by asking Chris um, to kick off and say, uh, well, who you are and where you're dialing in from? Hi, I'm uh, Chris Young from Number Five Chambers, and I'm dialing in from Cheltenham. Hello, Chris. Who's next? Um, I'll go. Sasha White, dialing in from Oxfordshire, showing my colours. I'm trying to work out what colours Chris has got on today because I've never seen a rugby club play in that top. But there we go. Hogwarts RFC. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get the memo. <laughs> Paul. Uh, yeah, um, my name's Paul Tucker. Uh, I'm a barrister and I'm based in Lancashire. Uh, and uh, half of my family is Irish, the other half is English. So I sort of split the difference with the rubber shirt. Or rather, that's what my wife told me I should wear anyway. Uh, and despite my name saying Chris Young on my screen, I'm not Chris Young. Just in case there's any doubt at all. <laughs> and it's great to be a sort of barrister, not a full-time chat show host. Just oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Mary, hello. Hello. <laughs> hello, I'm Mary, and I'm ringing in from uh, Wandsworth, Woody Wandsworth, as you can see from the background, and I'm a barrister partner at Town Legal. Hello, Mary. Uh, I, I should add, I'm, I'm not wearing a rugby shirt. I'll probably lose half my clients today by confessing I'm a football rather than rugby fan, and the other half by admitting to supporting West Brom. Uh, mm -hmm. But there you are, uh, wearing neither rugby clothes or, or our West Brom colours. Now, we've got a very special guest today who we're really extremely privileged to have because uh, probably one of the most busy people in our industry um, right now. Um, Sarah Richards, the Chief Executive of the uh, Planning Inspectorate. Sarah, um, hello. Um, I think you need to unmute yourself, which you've done. Um, tell us, wh where are you right now? I'm in um, sunny Bristol, or actually slightly less sunny now, but it was sunny. <laughs> Great stuff. Well, thanks again uh, for joining us. We really appreciate um, uh, that. And um, Sarah's feature stop will be in the second half of today's episode, but she'll be with us throughout. And uh, as I said to you before, Sarah, please do chip in with any comments on, on any matters uh, we're discussing before your stop, if you wish to, appreciating that given your role, uh, you may not be able to comment appropriately on anything, but please do if, if you'd like to. Um, Could, right. Charlie, before you go on, I think we should just say to Sarah, most of the people who work in our, her organisation dread having two barristers in front of them to agree <laughs> to that is a true, a true manifestation of the utmost bravery, so we should completely commend her. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Thank you okay. for that. I echo that. Um, now, our, our first um, topic uh, this week is Court Case of the Week. And um, Chris, I gather you're going to continue the tradition of you and Paul talking about each other's cases on this. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. Uh, a few people have commented on the fact that over the last couple of weeks, uh, all they've seen is me and Paul uh, back scratching, where he mentions <laughs> my case and I mention his. And that's fine for the appeals, but I have to be honest, when it comes to court cases, then the gloves come off, okay? So I've spent the last four weeks trying to find a case that Paul has lost. Not easy, because <laughs> he wins a lot, but I finally found one, and that's the only reason I've chosen it. It's of no that's greater easy. significance than that. Yeah. And if you think that's a bit acrimonious, uh, I've got two words for you, Paul, over there in Lancashire. The first word is Saint, and the second word is Modwin, okay? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> the scars are deep, my friend. Those scars are deep. Um, anyway, talking about the, the case that Paul lost uh, is uh, a case called Spitfire Homes and Warwick District Council. I'm just going to do some gentle product placement. We're open to advertising here on how we got planning <laughs> news, and uh, that's my tipple for the day. Um, it's really important, first of all, because it was all done remotely, uh, demonstrating that that is possible. But before, Sarah, I say any more, I recognise that inquiries are different. Okay? <laughs> so we'll come to that later. Yeah. Uh, now, Spitfire Homes is yet another legal case about heritage, as if we take any more fun in this area at all. It's a story about Huntley Lodge uh, and its replacement with a, uh, a small scheme, just uh, two houses and uh, six apartments located in a conservation area. Paul didn't do the inquiry. I think it was uh, a hearing or written reps. And um, it, Huntley Lodge is a non-designated heritage asset. Uh, it was a legal challenge to an inspector's decision, which Sarah will be delighted to hear, got absolutely nowhere. Um, and uh, that meant that the inspector had to consider, obviously, Section 72 of the Planning Listed Buildings and Conservation Act, 1972, and that required him to pay, as we know, special regard to the desirability of preserving and setting the character and appearance of the conservation area. Preservation in this, or preserving in this context, means doing no harm. So you can have neutral effects, as per Lord Bridges' judgment in the South Lakeland and Secretary of State for the Environment case. Now, what matters in this case is the building itself, Huntley Lodge. It sat in the middle of Northumberland Road, a fine road in Leamington, occupied by significant number of number five chambers and it was constructed <laughs> in the middle of the late 19th century. Uh, the original building extended uh, with a front wing um, across its whole width and the inspector thought that was what positively contributed to the conservation area and to Northumberland Road but it had been subsequently extended southwards so closer to Northumberland Road so that there were a number of extensions. First of all there was a two-story flat roof extension in white render. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> then a two-story buff terrace element uh, with a low-pitched roof and a gable. And then to add to the variety, there was a two-story um, uh, hipped roof uh, with mono pitches. So if your architectural taste is an eclectic mix of roof styles, then this building had it all for you, really. <laughs> and the inspector looked at Huntley Lodge uh, and um, in what the judge described as a nuanced appraisal of different parts of it. So he broke the house up in effect and looked at different bits. Now looking at it overall, the inspector said that the building as a whole, as a composition, detracts from the conservation character and appearance uh, and the significance of the conservation area. Uh, but he concluded the original part of the building without all those extensions was having a positive effect. So when it came to doing the assessment under Section 78 and the planning balance as well, the inspector focused on the positive and said that the loss of the positive aspect uh, of this building would be negative. He didn't like um, the uh, replacement building, thought it was too bulky, and as a consequence of which he didn't think it passed the test. Now, Paul's challenge was to say, you can't just look at the positive aspects of the building and the building was a non-designated heritage asset, so not a listed building, no, not a different test applied. Um, but the inspector thought it was acceptable to look at the building because the word, and part of it, because the word building can include parts of a building. So he only focused really on the positive parts of the building and said the overall effect was negative. 
And Paul's argument was, well, you need to look at the whole building. You need to look at the whole building because that's how you should approach this matter. And that would have led to the conclusion that the building was negative. And although the inspector was bound to find that there was a negative effect with the new building, um, he had to judge that against the fact that it may have been better than what was there before. And that wasn't the exercise done. But the judge was unpersuaded by that. We're going to hear no doubt why that was wrong in a minute. Um, but uh, the reality is that um, the, the, the call upheld the inspector's judgment. I mean, it raises real issues about how you split up a building and look at different components of it when it's not a listed building. But I'll let Paul perhaps cover those issues while I enjoy a Spitfire. <laughs> over, over to you, Paul. Lots, lots of comments about um, how um, Chris's uh, famous um, social media and PR skills have reached new levels by getting a rival barrister to rename himself Chris Young. So over to, <laughs> to explain, uh, to explain <laughs> why the judge was wrong. <laughs> well, well can I say, first of all, just on the set mod win, I'm extraordinarily grateful to you for that, Chris. You and I had a long-standing uh, running with that, taking in a uh, six-week inquiry, high court, court of appeal, and at the end of that, I know, tragically, I, I came out on top, and then all of the client's work went to one Charlie Banner, so both yeah. of us lost on that one. <laughs> uh, so That's my only thanks solace. for that one. And, and on Spitfire... <laughs> quite on, on, on Spitfire, I can genuinely say that I'm probably the only person on this panel, and maybe even amongst the part, uh, the uh, the delegates, who's actually flown a Spitfire, which I can tell you about at enormous length at uh, a later date. Um, sure, but I think that's probably enough product placement well. for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's two things I think we should draw draw from the case. The first of which is it's wrong. Um, no, sorry, that's not be more serious. I, I genuinely think it is incorrectly decided, but more importantly. The first thing to draw from the case is it's beautiful evidence of how the courts imply what I think is termed behind the scenes as benevolent construction or inherent conservatism with a small c or the way I tell my clients which is when you launch a challenge in the high court be aware that however clever you think the points are however good you think the points are the courts will take the starting point as I'm not going to quash this unless you've got a really really good point they bend over backwards uh, to, to try and avoid quashing, which I think ought to be some reassurance to Sarah and her colleagues um, that that's the approach that we take uh, as, as barristers when advising clients. And it's the approach that the court takes, which is not to interfere unless you've got a really knockout point. And for whatever reason, Mrs. Justice Andrews didn't think that that was the case. The, the case is also of significant interest because we dealt with it all during lockdown. Uh, we dealt with it on a telephone hearing. Um, it was dealt with in the best part of a day. It was done beautifully by the judge. We had a virtual hearing, we had a virtual bundle, and it worked. And it, in terms of the public, it was notified and advertised on the, uh, the relevant website, and the public would have been entitled to come and join us. In other words, it's evidence of the courts working and bending over backwards to try and help the system continue. And that's a point we can talk about in due course. Um, but yes, uh, well done for finding one of my losses, Chris. It must have taken you some time. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, one more case to, to just touch on briefly uh, on this subject um, is um, the, the announcement today from the Supreme Court that it's granted permission to appeal in, uh, in the Heathrow expansion case. Uh, it's been quite selective, so it's only granted permission to appeal to Heathrow Airport Limited um, and the Aurora Group, my clients, against the, the bit of the court appeal judgment that held that the, the airport's national policy statement, which endorsed the principal Heathrow expansion, was unlawful on the basis they didn't factor in the Paris Agreement on climate change, which is a, an international treaty that's not yet transposed into UK legislation. Other appeals by the parties weren't granted permission. Uh, and the notable thing for that, really, for planning practice, is that the, the Court of Appeals judgment has got implications that go well beyond Heathrow expansion uh, because what the court did is held that the Paris Agreement was government policy which under the Planning Act had to be had regard to when preparing a national policy statement and also was a legally necessary criterion under the climate change objective of the Planning Act um, and, that, and that part of judgment uh, potentially applies not just to NPSs uh, but to, to plan making because there's very similarly worded climate change objectives in the Planning Compulsory Purchase Act relating to development plans so potentially very broad implications and, and I and I'm sure others, um, other panellists and others participating in this 
uh, discussion, we'll, um, we'll have already seen people try and say that the Court of Appeals judgment applies in different contexts. So very interesting that the Supreme Court thinks there's, there's something in that point worthy of, of discussion. So watch this space. Um, before we go to the next, uh, so lots of, of comments about uh, uh, my, my shirt saying, am I in fancy dress this week? You ain't <laughs> seen nothing yet, mate. Uh, you ain't seen Don't nothing encourage yet. him. I'm, I'm not even trying. <laughs> I won't mention the time where uh, I received uh, an, an invitation by mistake that was addressed to Kylie Minogue and, and ended way to me to a fancy dress party uh, by uh, uh, David Williams. I very nearly went, but I thought that would probably be a breach of our code of conduct, given we're meant to have integrity. So I, I sent the invite back. But there we are. That's a story for another day. Anyway, on a serious note, now next up the, the pins planning appeal decision of the week. Uh, Mary, over to you. What are you going to uh, talk about? Well, before I talk about the Milton Keynes decision, I just want to mention a couple of other uh, decisions very quickly. The first one is a Secretary of State decision on a site in Southwark called Burgess Park, where one of your favourite inspectors, Christina Downs, was the inspector. And this is interesting because she talks about the difference between optimization and maximization. Mm. And, and in particular, she uh, endorses achieving a VSC, this is daylight and sunlight, uh, results below the VRE standard, but not as low, sadly, for the appellants as they wanted it, it to go. So she recommended and the Secretary of State agreed that the appeal should be dismissed. It's also interesting because she talks about the meaning of uh, exemplary design. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is something which I and I'm sure many of you out there will have grappled with. Uh, the next thing I wanted to mention was thanks to one of the viewers from last week who drew attention to an interesting enforcement notice case uh, on a site called Thornton Science Park, which was up in Chester. And this was a site which had once been owned by Shell and was next door to an oil refinery and had been bought by the university, Chester University. And sadly, they lost uh, their appeals against an enforcement notice, Cluids, and indeed a Section 78 appeal. And if anybody out there is interested in being reminded of the principles of the planning unit and issues about mixed use and sui generis uh, mixed use, it is a jolly good read. Um, so I, finally, uh, uh, but by no means least, I come to this Milton Keynes decision mm. because uh, at, at Bow Brickhill, um, there were four main issues, consistency with the settlement strategy, effect on character and appearance, and the impact on living conditions of residents, um, as well as the housing land supply. And the appellant lost on those first three issues. And, and so uh, really housing land supply uh, wasn't the determinative issue in the case, but nevertheless, it is particularly interesting. No issues on the requirement side. This was all about supply. This was a February inquiry. I always dislike doing housing land cases in February and March, where you're using a base date from the preceding April. Because one of the things that happens in that situation is that councils often introduce sites which have come forward since the base date. And I, I, I think actually that there were two sites included in the uh, decision as part of the supply, which seemed to have come in beyond the base date, uh, uh, which is un unusual. And I would suggest um, it is not the usual way of, of doing things. Yeah. But interestingly, the, the, what the inspector said was that the list in paragraph seven of the planning practice guidance uh, dealing with deliverability is not a closed list. She confirmed that she didn't rely on the council's use of pro forma, that she looked at each of the sites on their own merits. She acknowledged that the MPPF and the MPPG set what she said was a very high bar in terms of deliverability. She asked herself the right question. Was there the requisite evidence to establish a realistic, realistic prospect of housing sites being delivered? And she ruled some in and she ruled some out. Um, she didn't rule enough out. And the other thing that she uh, had to consider was the use of a discount. The council had used a discount of 10% in the fifth year of their five year housing land supply calculation. The appellants had used a 15.3 
very precise, you might think, discount. And that discount had come from a, a previous appeal decision at which, at which the inspector had endorsed the use of this discount. And a challenge to that had not been successful. So the appellants obviously went into bat there thinking that they were likely to win on the discount point because a, proceed, a previous inspector had endorsed it. And indeed there was a, a decision from the Secretary of State two years before in which the use of a discount had been endorsed. But the inspector said um, it's a matter for her own planning judgment and she gave effectively two reasons why she wasn't going to rely on the discount. One was there was a reduced reliance on strategic sites. And the second was that the plan had identified a capacity of 18% more dwellings than was actually needed. So this was a council that had bought themselves plenty of wriggle room. And so for that reason, she wasn't going to use the discount, as well as the fact that, of course, she's not required to use a discount in policy. So she found the whole thing contrary to the development plan and consequently um, it was dismissed. Thanks, Mary. Well, that's a, a neat uh, basis on which to, to segue into our, our next uh, feature, which is housing land supply. Before I do, uh, just a couple of Q&A from, and please do the Q&A, not the chat function, by the way. I think it's the Q&A function for any comments. Uh, Sarah, thought for you. Somebody said they're very interested to hear from you on, on the local plan process, potential reforms uh, to that. Um, so just a, a, a heads up on that. Uh, somebody said, why isn't Sasha wearing his true colours and Arsenal shirt? I don't know, but I'm going to nominate Sasha for this, that if, if in the Q&A we can raise by the end of this programme £500 for the NHS charity, then Sasha's going to wear a Spurs shirt next week, which I will procure. <laughs> <at my own laughs> and there you go, Sasha, you can't say no to that now. Well, Charlie, um, I'm very upset. You obviously think I'm an incredibly cheap gay. If you are. <laughs> you are. <laughs> we all know that. <laughs> We can have 5,000 to even consider it, let alone do it. Um, question for the other Chris Young, which I think is, is Paul. Uh, <laughs> the uh, as you're now known, does the benevolent construction approach apply, or the planning court apply equally to the LPA decisions as to Inspector Secretary of State? I thought the answer to that is a clear yes, isn't it, Paul? Mm. Friend, Chris. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Uh, and uh, finally, has Sasha been topping up his tan? Uh, maybe a, a, some, if I was a cruel person, I'd say it's not the only thing that needs topping up, Sasha, but, but there you go. Uh, anyway, um, on, on that note, uh, let's move to our feature, our first special feature, um, our housing land supply, and in particular the future of the housing land supply dates in the light of um, the COVID-19 crisis and its impact on housing delivery. And uh, Sasha, over to you, you're going to kick off on this one. Thank you very much, Charlie. And also thanks for revealing what it's like sharing chambers with you in the joy <laughs> Uh -huh. um, yes, I wanted to talk about, um, we talk obviously a critical issue, there's a recent report out that's come out, the context of this is a report that came out today from Knight Frank and I'll name drop them but it is worthwhile all of us considering it, this because the context is a prediction of a 35% drop in completions for 2021 and just talking about that in the context of a housing housing completions around 300,000 that is a very significant amount 35 percent so we're talking about something around 100,000 houses potentially not coming forward that might have otherwise come forward with no COVID so what are the consequences for the planning system well they're pretty enormous because what that happens potentially if the lockdown continues for say six months sorry to be a pessimist but it might be arguable that potentially every single local authority in Britain will not be able to show an HLS because there's not one unless they've got the foresight of Nostradamus who predicted six months of non-delivery across their administrative areas. So we are in a position where the decisions that Sarah's colleagues will face and local authorities will face will all be in a context where their trajectories have been being completely wrong. So the issue I want to raise is what should the government do? And I know this issue has been raised by both the house building sectors, the HBF, and of course the local authorities, both seeking a, a perspective and a view to be updated by the government. And I just wanted to throw in for discussion amongst our panel that my view is that the need should remain the same. I take that view not expediently in relation to work, but actually having just spent eight weeks with three children aged 18 to 23, I'm desperate to get them out as quickly as possible. 
But no, I think in all seriousness, the need has not gone anywhere. If anything, the events of the past three months have shown that the fundamental requirement and the shortfall in housing provision is more critical than ever. And I think it would be a mistake, in my view, if we if we lessened or relaxed that for two reasons. The reason I've said is because the need would go away. The second, and it's a very good issue, is viability. We're going to be in the context in the next six months to a year where many viability considerations are going to be raised in Section 106 commitments as a result of this, and they'll need to be revisited. If there is a lessening of the requirement, it will make it much more difficult for people to get relaxation in the 106. So I just wanted to open up to the panel and ask Mary, what, what do you think about what approach the government should take to housing need? I don't think there's any case for tinkering with national policy and the need for a five-year housing land supply. I think in the short term, yes, delivery will be held up, but the supply side ought to grow as councils continue. And this is the really important thing. Councils need to continue to grant planning permissions reserve matters applications and they need to continue discharging conditions. Um, those councils who have allocated more than they need have got some wriggle room and they've got something to fall back on if you like in, in recessionary times they will fare better. Those who've been dawdling over their local plans and who will be using uh, the standard methodology in a way don't need to worry about a uh, shortfall so much uh, or, or backlogs but they will have to continue to meet uh, housing land supply. And I think monitoring will be really critical. And I think that moving forward, there needs to be a more thought given, a more joined up thinking between different parts of local planning authorities, so that it's not just the policy people who are looking at delivery, but there's also uh, more thought given to from the development management side to what councils can do to really help uh, push through permissions, uh, uh, you know, the discharge of conditions, uh, dealing sympathetically with viability issues, considering uh, the deferment of uh, SIL stage payments. There are things, you know, there are there needs to be a, a real coming together of the different arms of uh, the, a planning department to try and enhance delivery. That will stand councils in good stead come 2021, 2022, when they're facing you lot in housing land supply appeals. Paul, Paul Young, or is it Chris Tucker? <laughs> <laughs> you are this. Yeah, can I, can I just say, behind the scenes, I have been begging to have this name changed, but apparently it's so funny that uh, nobody's, nobody's willing to assist. It's not going to change now. <laughs> so ne next one I lose, well, I'm going to tell the court my name is Young, Chris Young. Um, yeah, can, can I just pick up and just view things from the other side of the uh, of, of, of the table, as it were. Um, the, the first thing to say is there's no magic to the five-year land requirement. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a matter of law, it's a matter of policy, and policy can be changed very quickly by the Secretary of State. PPG can be changed pretty much overnight uh, by the Secretary of State, and we can react to what is an exceptional period of time. Um, for a long time in the 1990s, we didn't have a five-year land supply test. Uh, it was uh, at the start of my career, and then we had about eight years where we didn't have it, and it's been abolished in Wales. Um, I do right, wonder Paul, whether so or not there's a problem. In the 1990s, by the way. There, there are things I could say, Charlie, but I think this is a family show, so I don't think <laughs> I'm able to. Don't hold back. Um, don't hold back. <laughs> go on. Right, back to reality. There's, there's, there's a danger, to be blunt, about the way in which we, we look at housing land supply and housing need in an over formulaic way and an overly complex way. Uh, throwing the tilted balance and you've got a, a, a prospect of looking at argument for the sake of argument rather than looking at what's an authority done, why is it not being able to deliver, what's the development industry done and what can be done to try and help things. There's obviously two dynamics. Any right thinking person would think there are two dynamics. We need more houses. But equally, you don't want to put unwarranted pressure on local authorities, underscored by the difficulty of, of COVID-19, uh, COVID, COVID it's nothing to do with crows, um, who are doing their best to plan for need um, by ignoring the fact the house building industry is going to be hamstrung by all this. Mm -hmm. There is a need for cleverer people than I to sit back and think how we can tweak the system to avoid the over complexity, putting pressure on authorities, mm -hmm. resulting in sites that really aren't sustainable coming forward, but also delivering development in the right place and my view for what it's worth is the problems the development plan system and i know we're going to talk about this in a, in a further episode but 
if it was me, if I was made Secretary of State tomorrow, I'd abolish the soundness test and probably revoke most legislation back to 2004 and get on with plan making properly. Um, but I don't think that the issue is just carry on as we were before. I don't think the issue is carry on with fiber land supply. There needs to be an intervention and it has to be an intervention for the Secretary of State. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, so yeah, we, we hear a lot for, about the local, um, about the developer's side, but to look at it from the local authorities' side, and can I just say my answer this week is sponsored by Castle Point District Council, <laughs> uh, who seem to never have a five-year land supply. Um, but looking at it from that <coughs> point of view, there is nothing that is the responsibility um, of the authorities going on here. This has happened as a supervening event and the supply will suffer. We don't know quite as much. How can that be the authority's fault? I agree entirely with Paul. There are bigger issues at play here about housing requirements and making sure that every authority meets its own if it can't find a neighbor to take it. But there has to be some kind of adjustment here because of the circumstances. Now, I think the big issue is whether we see anything soon from the government, perhaps a written ministerial statement or something like that, which indicates whether we're going to have a support for economic growth like we did in 2008 and the written ministerial statements there in the following Greg Clark statements, which say, you know, we just want you to deliver as many sites as possible. Then, then I can see a lack of relaxation of anything, as Mary suggested. But I think in reality, there'll be a huge amount of political pressure on ministers from uh, many of their own members uh, in local councils and they'll be saying we need some kind of holiday here from the five-year land supply and I think I think that's inevitable. Thanks, can I, so, so sorry can I just chip in and say is the real question when and when and how is the government going to address the falling uh, population ONS for uh, population uh, figures, because there's an opportunity, as you just indicated, Chris, isn't there, for them to, in fact, uh, adjust the requirement down. Um, and that, that seems to me to be a question that a lot of local planning authorities are, are waiting for anyway. Uh, and really, does, does, it, does this whole episode of COVID-19, is it going to make the government less or more ambitious? I think that's an interesting question. I mean, I wouldn't advocate for reducing the requirement. We've got a housing crisis. We've got a, a plan-led housing crisis. Uh, so we need to change the plan-led system because it's not delivering enough homes. But I think in terms of the latest population projections and, and also the household projections that follow them, that is part of a much wider problem. And I think the government is looking at this. I think they realize there's a problem with the household projections. And, um, you know, some of the people looking at this are inside government, like uh, Simon Gallagher. It'd be great if we could get him on the show as a guest, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And um, <laughs> perhaps you can have a word, Sarah. Uh, and so um, I think the problem is um, be sympathetic to councils now about the predicament they find themselves in, but let's get the right housing requirements uh, so that we're all delivering enough houses. Thanks, Chris. A couple of uh, questions. One person asked a, a general question, very important question, though, which is, uh, is the definition of um, deliverable sites in the framework a closed list or an open list? That, that thorny question. Well, without prejudice to me standing up in front of an inspectoral court and arguing the contrary, for what it's worth, I think it's a closed list, but there you go. Um, um, some, local, um, some people have asked, how should in practice local authorities take into account COVID uh, in uh, calculating five-year supply from a base date of April 2020? where plainly it is something. Um, well, I think so one, one point I'd just say in that context is do expressly take it. It's, it's really important not to um, ignore or deny its existence, but also um, think proactively about um, how can the tools available to a local authority be used to facilitate delivery. And um, so, for example, um, uh, proactively monitoring what sites have stalled for how long and why and it seems to me that the effects of covid on on particular sites will differ for example they'll differ between local authorities they'll differ within local authorities depending on whether their location is urban or greenfield housing type is it flats is it is it houses what is it that, what kind of developer is it large national is it a smaller developer and the prognosis will differ because some sites it's uh, a matter of 
a couple of lost months of construction and slower progress with social distancing. For others, the developer may have had to mothball the site for a variety of reasons, or potentially for some smaller developers, even worse, the developers facing potential insolvency. So I think some monitoring and understanding the precise matrix of what's going on in the local thought is really important. And if I may uh, provide no another shout out for e to East Riding of Yorkshire, not for, uh, uh, replacing their former, former uh, very learned QC with, with myself uh, for some of their work. Um, but what they did in, in, in the run up to an a, uh, inquiry I did for them towards the back end of, of 2017 was um, put together a prospectus of, avail of particular available housing sites they wanted to facilitate the delivery of to sort of drum up interest in the market and it was criticised at the inquiry by the appellant as, as being a sort of concession that these were problem sites but the inspector saw it as a commendable example of council being proactive and in thinking about what tools can it use to facilitate its housing land supply so maybe in the right um, circumstance local authorities could think about a, um, a, a way of publishing a sort of COVID-19 action plan or, or monitoring uh, document, something like that, to as a, as a means of, of uh, proactively showing um, that it, they're looking at ways of, of, of positively addressing this. Um, well, now, tempting as it may be to continue <laughs> with uh, with Charlie's uh, Charlie's uh, current work that he's taken off me. Uh, I think it's probably now, now time to to speak to Sarah. Uh, he's been sitting very patiently listening to us rabbit on so far. Um, and, and Sarah, I've been volunteered to ask you a few questions, uh, if that's okay. Um, and I know that uh, you're probably the one person that everybody else is tuning in for. There'll be about six tuning in for uh, for the rest of us, but for you, it's the extra hundreds and hundreds that are currently listening. And um, so, the first question I've got, Sarah, really is. Um, we know that a huge amount's changed during, during lockdown. Local government decision making is now radically different, um, for example. What, what's PINs been doing to adapt, meet, adapt to meeting its workload uh, in response to COVID-19? Well, I think uh, from an organisational perspective, you'll appreciate that our, in our inspectors all uh, work from home. But overnight, we moved from everybody else being in the office to working from home. And that's quite a big shift. For a large workforce so that, you know in the first few weeks that took up some time um, we've been progressing the work that could be completed so we've actually issued over 2,000 decisions since lockdown started um, and as many of you know and I know there'll be a matter of interest this evening is we've been developing our digital events formats and um, we're currently prioritizing national infrastructure hearings inquiries and local plans and we're starting work in other areas such as CPO hearings. Um, obviously this involves us, and we'll talk about this more, about in a more joined up approach with all of those involved. Uh, the fourth thing that we've been doing is high on our list at the moment is we are planning on starting site visits again, maybe as early as next week. So there's quite a lot of work to do to ensure the health and safety of our staff, uh, inspectors who are going out on site. Um, and so we'll be looking at unaccompanied site visits and so on, as I say, potentially from the beginning of next week, but it may take a further week to ramp up. And then in terms of our inspector workforce, we've seconded uh, nearly 10% of our inspector workforce to MHCLG to support their work that they're doing with local government on the shielding programme. So, I mean, those are some of the headlines. Obviously, we've been doing other stuff as well. Well, the, the one thing that I'm sure uh, certainly is of interest to um, colleagues on, on, the, uh, on, on this uh, event um, is, is why do you think that PINs haven't moved as fast as some might have wanted you to on virtual hearings and virtual inquiries? Uh, I think some of us would have been desperate for that to happen in week two of lockdown, and obviously we're in week no, six no, or I, seven now, and uh, it's I, not happened yet completely understand that and um, often the question is asked why aren't we going faster the courts don't have any problem and you've already explained how you have any problem and I think the reality is that the courts are doing groundbreaking work um, and and we are watching it and learning from it as well a couple of things that and I know you touched on it so um, we could probably have a conversation about it is that the courts don't have quite the same considerations we do about community involvement and also they've had the benefit which we haven't had possibly yet may not um, of emergency legislation that explicitly enabled them to do this so i think we're in a slightly different place but as you know we're working with all of those who are interested in this uh, 
PIBA, NIPA, the RTPI and the Law Society to identify some of the issues. Um, but, you know, the planning inspectorate wants to ensure that any decision made in a, either a recommendation report decision is legally robust and meets all of our expectations as professionals, but also the standards that are, are, are demanded and wanted by those who use our service in the wider public. So it is an, a really important. I'm not saying those considerations don't apply in the legal system, but we probably have a broader set of immediately active uh, stakeholders and actors. We are making fast progress um, and we've got two planning hearings. Uh, we've got the first one on Monday um, and we're anticipating a fairly speedy ramp up from that. Um, in addition, we have in the final stages of arranging digital events to take place in June for at least three uh, national infrastructure projects and at least one local plan and we're preparing others to take place from July. I mean, there is always a lag once we've worked out the technology because of the notification periods. And there is a complexity for us because we're operating within at least four different uh, casework systems. Uh, I'm gonna ask Chris, oh, sorry, Sarah. I was gonna say, um, I'm gonna ask Chris to come back with regard to local plans in a minute. I know that Charlie's got a question with regard to the cultural approach of, of pins. That might be an appropriate time, Charlie, if you'd step in and ask the question. Yeah, th thanks, Paul. Um, so really just following up what you said about legal challenge, and I, I wondered what, what do you have to say to those who might be thinking, well, maybe the inspectorate are a little bit too um, overly concerned about the risk of legal challenge. And uh, is it, in your view, um, an appropriate time to be a little less cautious? And, and what, what's PIN's approach to its risk appetite corporately in this context? Yeah. I mean, I think we would, I would, you know, as chief exec, come back and say we're funded by taxpayers' money. It's absolutely right that we're careful in how we operate and take a proportionate, and I think the question here is about what is proportionate in these unprecedented circumstances. I mean, we have actively uh, considered the level, the degree of risk that's appropriate for us to take. And actually in practice, we're accepting higher risks than we traditionally have. That's been a conscious decision by myself and my leadership team. Um, but in order to progress with digital events, um, and we know it's in everybody's interest to do this, we want them to be uh, robust decisions that come out because it's in nobody's interest, anybody, any of the four parties involved, that there are legal challenges fairly further down the line. Um, and so we are starting small and learning. And so Monday's case is a small case, but gives us a chance for, for learning. Because what we want to do is embed this as our normal way of working. It was always a project for us for this year anyway, to explore and move some of our activity to virtual events. So what this has done has enabled us to bring it forward and actually, as I say, we want to embed it in our work. This isn't just something for COVID-19. And so it's really important that we work out um, something that's sustainable for the organisation. And, and what lessons are you looking to learn from the event that's going to take place on Monday? Apart from the extraordinary news of having an appeal on a Monday. That's revolutionary <laughs> to me. <laughs> that's my golf done. <laughs> <laughs> Is that one of the benefits of inspectors not travelling? It may well be, yes. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm not quite sure why it's Monday. It may have been the day that's best suited to all the parties involved. So, um, so what are we hoping to learn? Well, some really practical stuff. You know, uh, anybody who spends all day doing video calls knows how tiring it is. So there is something, yeah. you know, a lot of our face-to-face -face events just go on all day. You might have a break for coffee, a break for lunch. But actually, it you can't do that when you're working like this. It's about how robust is the technology. Um, we're going to be using Microsoft Teams. Um, how robust is it? How do we engage with those who don't have access to it? You know, we're we going to be using phones. How do we do that? So there's going to be a lot of lessons learned around this and, and really practical things for us. Um, and uh, yeah. That's why we're taking it slowly, but we do anticipate over the after the first few cases are done that we will ramp up fairly quickly. Uh, okay, I think Chris, you wanted a question with regards to local plans. 
Yeah, Sarah, so obviously, you know, we're all asking very much in terms of the immediate inquiries and your work is much wider, as you've said. Uh, I noticed your comments on the West Midlands interchange granted this week in the Greenbelt, good yeah. decision by the Secretary of State. Um, but a lot of the work is actually local plan work. So we understand that's different. We understand that looks even less like a court case. What actually is going to happen with local plan work? Have you got any local plans scheduled to go remote? Yeah, so we were planning on holding a local plan hearing in early June by telephone conference. Okay. The stumbling block, and we can talk about this, is that one, because one of the participants doesn't use the internet, so phone is the only option. So that's the first one we'll be doing. And we've got practical arrangements have already started and we're in conversation with South Oxfordshire to run those hearings digitally. Now we anticipate that we'll be able to let people know more about that, but we are in later on this month, but we are in discussion with the council at the moment. Paul, can but I just, sorry, go on, sorry, Sarah, yeah, can't. So we're still issuing reports and letters. We're doing advisory visits and uh, we're again looking at the hybrid approach. So is it fully digital? Are they hybrid? So we, how much do we do by written reps and how much in inquiry? Okay, can I just ask, sorry Paul to jump in there, but you mentioned South Oxfordshire. We of understand why that might be a candidate case because obviously the Secretary of State wants their plan adopted by, um, by December. But can I just say the point you made about a, a participant doesn't have a computer because I think this is the nub of the issue, isn't it really? If most of us can use computers, it's much better to be able to see each other, body language, all the rest of it. If one participant, uh, I'm not asking you to name them, but you can. Uh, if, if one participant doesn't want to use that, then that's fine. You can involve them with te a telephone. But does that mean everything has to descend to the lowest level? Um. I wouldn't disagree with you. And this is one of these areas of risk appetite. How far do we push this? Mm -hmm. So I think that is an area that we're exploring um, about how do we help those who have least access to the system uh, the and the technology, how do we help them get involved? Um, so that's part of our learning, learning how it works, looking at, which is why we're starting with a smaller local plan hearing, and if we have to do it by phone, then we'll try it so that we can see how it works. If it doesn't, I mean, you know, Paul talked about a court case being dealt with by phone. So it's not, you know, it's not unheard of. So again, this is about learning and what's the best way for inspectors to get the information, be it the evidence for making a decision on appeal, uh, the information for a local plan, information for making recommendations on national infrastructure. How do they best get that information? Sarah, can I just... Uh, it's an interesting... Sorry. sorry, sorry, Mary, please. I, I was just going to ask, what, what assistance can um, the parties involved in the system, many of whom may well be among the hundreds of participants tonight, what, what assistance can they give? What message would you give to them about how they can help you um, move the system forward? <laughs> That's a really good question, and thank you for that. I mean, I think the first thing is actually to recognise we are doing lots and working hard to keep all of our work moving and to help. It would be really helpful for reinforcing that if you um, have clients and local planning authorities listening to us this evening. I mean, we have issued more than 2000 decisions since lockdown. Um, we're delivering and, and, you know, the proposal to deliver entirely new formats for many different sorts of services in six months is a big undertaking. Um, it would be helpful for support for inspectors in digital events by keeping sessions focused. I mean, we always ask this, you know, how many sheets of paper, how many piles of paper do we need? Um, and <laughs> a slightly uh, tongue in cheek, but it isn't always helpful to compare us to the courts. Um, because it is different and I think it would be helpful to recognise there are some key risks here that could potentially undermine the system a bit further down the line um, because I think it's in everybody's interest. There isn't any part of the system that it's not in their interest to have robust decision making. And then... The, this, you know, there's an interest... Sorry. Yeah, and the, the final thing... I was going to say... The, the, 
but can I just go over two final things that'd be really helpful of course. to talk about? Um, and this is the technology. We, we're using Microsoft Teams. Uh, as many of you will know, Zoom isn't secure. Um, and so we are using, so increasing your familiarity and those of anybody you work with, their familiarity of Microsoft Teams would be helpful. And we've got a GDPR issue as well, um, which is that uh, Microsoft Teams displays email addresses. And um, yeah, interestingly, and uh, uh, I know that Bridget, Bridget Rosewell has a very particular view about GDPR, but it is an issue. I don't have a lot of time to spend putting cases and breaches into the information commissioner. So, you know, we just, we need to um, understand that these are some of the practical constraints. Mm. The, the, there, there is, I mean, it occurs to me from what you said, Sarah, the obvious of what, what you and Chris were talking about is that there are potentially opportunities to un enfranchise people who ordinarily wouldn't go to inquiry and wouldn't go to hearings by using video technologies. So it's not just about the lowest common denominator, it's actually expanding the opportunity for public involvement. Um, Sasha, did you have a question? Yeah, I just want to ask Sarah, you've obviously done on what you've said a huge amount of work in the past few months and the resources devoted to coping with COVID-19 sound pretty strong. What, what, what is going to be the consequence of the work you've done in the, over the past few months for the future in a non-COVID-19 world? What, what lessons, what implementation do you think that the planning inspector will do longer term that will affect us all as a, as a result of this? Um. Well, I, I think I've already said that it was always our ambition this year to do trials, some new approaches using technology for our casework. I mean, the other area I haven't touched on is we are running a small project looking at sites, uh, for inspectors triaging them to see whether a site visit is actually required. So we, as many of you know, we issued our first decision last week where no site visit was carried out. Um, and that takes us into quite tricky territory as well, as you can imagine, um, from a whole variety of perspectives. Um, but we will continue with that. And uh, we are obviously going to continue with uh, working with working virtually because this is, you know, it's good for everybody. Mm. Um, so, I mean, we've learned a lot about uh, how an organisation moves from being an what I describe sometimes as an analog organization to being a virtual organization. You can't just transfer your day-to-day face-to-face and paper stuff into this virtual environment. So we are learning a lot about that. Mm. Um, and it's what's also been helpful, notwithstanding my comment about everybody comparing us to the legal system or the court system, is that actually we've had a tremendous amount of feedback from users and some really collaborative approaches which has been fantastic so I don't think we want to lose any of that you know it's built new relationships we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for COVID-19 would we um, and uh, you know I guess the question is how many of these I got an email this evening from a, a well-known planning consultancy saying oh we've just done a, a, a webinar you know come to our website you know how much of this will survive and what what will what will be sustainable but we're absolutely clear that what we're doing has to be sustainable for the long term we don't have the resources to do a short-term fix and go back to how things were before thank you very much uh, well i think uh, just just on, the, on bridget rosewell um, i think she's actually unless somebody's impersonating it has just suggested that post brexit we've got an opportunity to have a more sensible policy on gdpr but that means there's now a fine in place where I'm going to get it for mentioning the B word. So I'm sorry about that. Um, Charlie, I think you had a burning desire to talk about your research for some reason. I, I just, uh, so on the issue about the accessibility to the, 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 the tech, um, I, I wondered whether you thought there was a distinction between, on the one hand, having access to technology, on the other hand, familiarisation with it. Um, uh, I mean, uh, the research that Kit Kat and I and others did for our, our article, which I'm sure you and others have seen is, that 95% of households have access to a 3G or 4G phone. Uh, and if that's right, and I, I couldn't find any reason to suggest it wasn't, that suggests that the issue is mainly about familiarisation and, and confidence in the, in the technology rather than access to it. I, I just wondered whether you had any, any views on that. Um, I, I wouldn't disagree with what you're saying. Um, however, if I would just to tell you that, um, and this gives you some context of, of 
our, the situation it places us in. So we've been working on uh, getting an inquiry ready to be done virtually in the beginning of June. Um, and today we've received 30 letters of objection to running it as a virtual event and the Rule 6 party, make, one of the Rule 6 parties, making a specific point about fairness and access. So, you know, these are real issues. We're not inventing them. You know, they're out there. I mean, you may be interested to know that for our pilot work on inquiries, we looked at 10 inquiries, which included two of the ones that PIBA had suggested um, and contacted all the main parties. Um, and uh, there was a range of resistance from local authorities who just feel they can't get engaged to third parties who don't want to do it. We really struggled to find some cases to put through this. So um, it's not that we're not trying, um, but you know, we need some help as well, I think, from all parties involved to, to make this happen. It, it, it's, it's an interesting time that we live in, Sarah. I mean, I say this with five other barristers on here, but also wearing the, chip, the hat of Vice Chair of PIBA where the planning inspectors uh, are able to call upon professional organisations like the one that I'm vice chair of to try and assist. We stand ready to help. Um, so in terms of assisting in terms of the, these conundrums, I know there's been advice that have gone in, Charlie and Kit Kat have done one. Um, uh, we, we submitted one, um, I think Tim Mould did it and was submitted in early stage. It's an extraordinary time when you can call for free advice from most of the planning bar to assist. And Chris, I think last, last question, you were desperate to, to dip in. So yeah, I should I say that it's only only in relation to the ones you've had so far. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's um, Paul Brown, who you've been working with, Sarah, uh, is the chairman of the Planning Bar Association, a uh, widely respected member of the Planning Bar, very level-headed uh, individual, if I may say so, and they're very popular with the inspectors. That's the end of the advert, by the way. Um, and uh, the, the point that Paul <laughs> makes, which I think is a very, it's a very fair one, is look at the system now. The system at the moment is not engaging everybody at all. An awful lot of the people you hear from are the retired people who've already got houses built on green field sites in the 1960s and 70s, and they object. And the system shouldn't work just for them, although they seem to dominate the presence and inquiries. There's an awful lot of people who are at work. There are an awful lot of people who are in less well-paid jobs. And this digital transformation that you're talking about could help to involve them in the inquiry process. And the answer, I think, isn't, if I may say so, um, to look at this as a negative, but to look at this as a positive. Embrace the ability that in people's lunch hours in their job, they might join the inquiry and let you know how desperate they are for houses in their village, in their town. And look at it, nobody wants to stop the whole event from happening physically. Let's try and involve more people. Because at the moment, I think most people at the planning bar would say, inspectors here, far too much from one particular demographic. Mm. I also think that though, as, I, I councils, think... as councils determine planning applications using virtual meetings, for example, so those engaging at the planning application stage will understand the technology and, and everybody will, will learn. And the great thing is to make, make sure that we uh, take the best of, of what we learn from COVID and continue to use it going forward. Mm. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think Sarah when the barristers are asking their questions and answering them that we're probably probably at, at yeah. the point at which uh, we need to draw it to a close is there anything else that you wanted to to add to those who are online or uh, can I just then now dive into my thanks to you for the really really generous uh, offer of your time and, and what's been a very very interesting uh, session frankly yeah. no and it's been a pleasure to do it and hopefully you know it's been helpful for those listening in as well so thank you very much Really grateful to you, Sarah. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. You're very welcome. And back to Thank Charlie. You. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you for me too, Sarah. Um, right, next up, um, praise of the week. Uh, Sasha, over to you. Yes, very quickly in view of the time, I just wanted to praise. It's a sign of the times for all of us. Mm. That was the decision by Westminster Council to turn the car park in Cavendish Square, which many of us have used, um, into, a, into an alternative health and well-being centre and I think this is a really really important decision for two reasons first of all major application done all virtually obviously in the context of COVID-19 the second point is normative what's happened an underground car park much beloved of 60s and 70s planners mm. sorry Sarah to be 
to make that comment but obviously what we've got now is a well-being centre and what an extraordinary alternative use from prime site in central London so that's my praise of the week. Thanks Sasha. Uh, nudge of the week is for me and I'm going to take inspiration from a recent judgment of the Northern Irish High Court regarding planning enforcement. I know there's a, a number of viewers from Northern Ireland uh, including some members of the Planning Appeals Commission there so hello to you. Thank you very much for, for tuning in. Um, the case is called Donnelly's application for JR. It was a challenge to Omar District Council's decision not to take enforcement action in relation to various breaches of, of a mining uh, planning commission. Um, there's also interesting stuff in the judgment um, generally, but the point the, that is the nudge is that the, the judge um, held that it, it wasn't um, adequate for a planning infor authorities enforcement team to have an approach of only taking enforcement or only looking into enforcement action when a member of the public complained. He thought that uh, it was necessary for enforcement teams to be to be more proactive and he said in particular that um, a system reliant only on complaints wasn't um, compliant uh, in his view with the Northern Ireland EIA regulations which is the same as the English one so the Welsh one so a point of application over um, this side of the Irish Sea too. So the nudge from the court is for local authorities uh, enforcement teams um, to be proactive in monitoring non-compliance. Obviously many of them, uh, if not all, are, are in any event. There's obviously a limit to that because of the resources implications, but for example for EIA sites where there's a planning commission in place, maybe consideration needs to be given to what proactive steps can be done to monitor compliance with conditions. I should add finally that I was under strict instructions not to attempt any accents during this. No, no, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Sasha, I had an inquiry in front of a inspector who had an Antipodean accent um, about a year ago that Sasha had been in front of and he told me and the client who we both know well um, that he was an Australian uh, uh, inspector and during the first interval the, the client's actually online right now listening in um, and, and he uh, my, my client uh, sat, happened to be next to the inspector at the urinal and he said uh, which part of Australia are you from and the answer was New Zealand mate and we lost um, <laughs> which I accept yeah, yeah. And, and just to make sure that we keep to make sure we keep our Northern Irish listen, uh, uh, listenership, by the way, Charlie, it's pronounced Omar, it's not Omar. Yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> exactly. Well, always, uh, with, as somebody from Burley, I'm always certainly uh, bound to get the, the pronunciation uh, wrong. Now, Mary, you're going to tell us what's coming up next week. Yes, next week we hope to have a really special guest uh, and uh, all the details uh, will hopefully be circulating on Monday of next week. And... Uh, our special topic next week is going to be about the role of judicial review in planning decisions, um, particular take, particularly looking at planning decisions taken at local authority level. But also I, I think we're going to come back to this theme about um, uh, decisions of the planning inspectorate. Um, mm. But what are the courts looking at in particular and what is of real concern to them? Mm. Thanks very well. Hopefully we'll be able to reveal our special guest uh, very shortly. As usual, um, we will um, send out the flyer um, and, and announce the details of next week's show on, on Monday. Um, the meeting code uh, and password will be the same as what you've already got. Um, so for those of you tuning in, just use them again. And um, thank you so much for joining us again. And particularly thanks to Sarah for coming on and facing our, our, our questions. Uh, really great, really, really useful and helpful insights and encouraging as well as the, the progress that's being made. Um, please speak, come join us next week, same time, same place, Thursday, 14th of May. Have a uh, wonderful bank holiday weekend. Uh, I've sort of kind of forgotten what, what is the weekend and what's not. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, please don't forget to think about making a donation to the NHS charity or a charity of your choice. Um, please follow our LinkedIn page. We'll put um, a Q&A comments thread there for any, any questions and answers. Um, and have a lovely evening, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.